So chapter six and chapter one, the remainder of chapter one, uh, it's actually unit 1.3, pages 14 through 24. Uh, but we're going to integrate it in with chapter six because they go nicely together. So let's talk a little bit about microbial nutrition. Uh, like all cells, bacteria will require a constant influx of certain substances from their habitat. Uh, all organisms require things like carbons, hydrogens, oxygens, phosphorus, nitrogen, uh, chloride, magnesium, and other types of elements. Uh, anything that an organism must have is what we term an essential nutrient. Uh, in other words, the absence of that particular nutrient will cause the organism to die. Um, fastidious organisms are actually a sort of specific group uh, an organism that we would think of as fastidious uh, would be a picky or fussy eater. Uh, usually these are ones we refer to as having specialized nutrient requirements. Uh, for example, uh, an organism that must live in high levels of zinc would be a fastidious organism. Uh, it's got to have the zinc. It's picky about where it lives because of the zinc requirement. Uh, we also divide nutrients into both macronutrients and micronutrients, with macronutrients being required in large amounts. Okay? Uh, usually these encompass those macromolecules that we're going to talk about a little bit later, uh, playing major roles in cell metabolism or structures. Meanwhile, the micronutrients, also known as trace elements, are needed in much smaller amounts. Uh, in fact, they are usually required to be in very small amounts. Most of them are involved in the functionality of enzymes. There are things like cofactors um, or possibly the maintenance of protein structure. Think iron and a hemoglobin molecule. Um, basically, these are required in very small amounts. Uh, oftentimes, you'll also see it where uh, in larger amounts, these can actually be dangerous to the organism. We can also divide nutrients into both inorganic and organic nutrients. I usually start with the organic nutrients. Uh, the easiest way to tell if something is an organic nutrient would be if it contained carbons and hydrogens. Okay. These are products of normal living things and components of pretty much all uh, organic macromolecules. Uh, these can be simple molecules like methane, this will be methane, CH4, uh, or large polymers like macromolecules. Okay. Hopefully, a few of you remember this one. You'll be familiar with it later. Okay. This is the chemical formula for glucose. Okay. Uh, this one is obviously a macromolecule. It contains carbons and hydrogens. Okay. In organic nutrients, do not contain both carbons and hydrogens. Uh, they can have one, but not necessarily have the other. These are usually what form things like uh, the soil, bodies of water, the atmosphere. So if, for example, water would be inorganic. Okay. Carbon dioxide, also inorganic, even though it's got a carbon, it's still missing the hydrogen component. Uh, O2, okay. <clears throat> okay. but then again, okay. uh, this one would be organic while this one was inorganic. Okay. That combination of carbons and hydrogens are going to be what you look for. Okay. Now, if we look at the components of a cell, the vast majority of the cell is water. The most common molecule okay, within a cell okay, is going to be water. Okay. Uh, within the water we will find proteins. Uh, organic compounds will make up 97% of the dry weight of the cell. In other words, when we take away the water, 97% of it is organic compounds. 96% um, of that, okay, uh, so all but a very small portion of those organic compounds are made up of the elements carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphates, phosphorus, and sulfur, okay. 
these are the main constituents of most of the macromolecules and chemical components of cells. Okay? Everything else is in much, much smaller amounts. So we see carbons, hydrogens, oxygens, nitrogens, phosphorus, and sulfur being the main components of molecules within cells. Okay? If it helps you remember, okay, we chomp on the chomps. Okay? Now what that means is that what we're going to have to bring in to maintain those normal levels of carbons and hydrogens and oxygens and nitrogens and phosphorus and sulfur uh, is that what we're going to have to bring into the cell nutrients that are brought in must also contain okay, those six elements. Okay. Now, most chemical elements are available to the cell as compounds, not as pure elements. You're not going to eat pure carbon or pure nitrogen. Um, but the nice part about this is that what this means is that you only need a few types of nutrients to synthesize lots of different types of things. Uh, specifically, cells will only need a few types of nutrients to synthesize over five thousand different compounds within a cell. Uh, we are excellent recyclers. What we're going to do is okay, take those carbons and nitrogens and hydrogens from one type of molecule, break them apart, and restructure them to form a different type of molecule. This is the beauty of the monomer polymer system. Okay? that if we have something that is made up of several types of monomers, okay, we can always break it down okay, and rearrange it into something else. Okay. Now, what we're going to talk about here are macromolecules, and this starts that chapter 1, unit 3. Uh, macromolecules, very large molecules. This is the main components uh, that you will find within cells. Uh, divided into four main categories, carbohydrates, also called sugars, lipids or fats, proteins, and nucleic acids. Uh, if you look over here, one thing you'll notice is that proteins make up about 50% of the dry weight of cells. Okay. Uh, nucleic acids together, DNA and RNA about 23%, 10% carbohydrates, 10% lipids. Okay. So the vast majority, okay. and again here you see it, here's our chomps, okay. the vast majority okay, of the cell is made of proteins, nucleic acids, lipids, and carbohydrates. Okay. So since we're on the subject of the monomer polymer system, okay, let's talk about the monomers and polymers for each of these. Uh, carbs, if anybody remembers, the monomers are monosaccharides. Okay. Uh, you also hear them called simple sugars. Uh, lipids are often said not to have a monomer. If you do name one, the most prominent one we see in lipids are uh, fatty lipids. Sorry, fatty acids. Okay. Uh, proteins. The monomers of proteins are amino acids. Sorry for the handwriting. And the monomers of nucleic acids are. nucleotides. Okay. So lots of amino acids put together make a protein, lots, several fatty acids joined to one another make a lipid, several nucleotides together make a nucleic acid, things like RNA and DNA, and monosaccharides or simple sugars joined together make complex carbohydrates. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about the carbohydrates. I'm not going to get too far into it. Uh, I would like to talk mainly about carbohydrates in reference to microorganisms. Okay. Uh, carbs generally have the chemical formula 
CH2O uh, parentheses N. Okay. Now, what this means is that for every one carbon, okay, there are two hydrogens and there is one oxygen. Okay. So when we use the formula C6, we're saying there are six carbons, which means there should be six times two, 12 hydrogens, okay. six times one, six oxygens. And again, we remember that this is our old friend, glucose. Okay. Uh, but this would be what we call a hexose, okay. meaning that it's got six sugars. Um, there are pentoses, C5H10O5. Okay. Uh, trioses, C3H6O3, okay, all of which follow the same generalized formula. Okay. Now, polysaccharides or carbohydrates okay, uh, actually have two main functions within the cell. They contribute to structural support and protection. Uh, this is the basis of sugars being used within the cell wall. Okay and or they serve as nutrients and energy stores. This is your typical thought of glucose going through things like cellular respiration. Okay. Uh, examples of this, cellulose found in plants and algae. It's the most common cell wall component in plants and algae. Um, auger that we use to make media solids is actually a sugar. Okay. Uh, specifically, it's a derivative of seaweed. Uh, peptidoglycan, our two polysaccharides, NAG and NAM, I'm sorry, our two monosaccharides, our two sugars joined together, NAG and NAM, uh, the main component of bacterial cell walls. Uh, the lipopolysaccharide layer, which we find in the outer membrane, okay, if you remember specifically, these are kind of gram negative bacteria. And even the glycocalyx, which is that sticky outer coating, uh, included capsules and things like uh, slime layers. So talk a little about lipids, uh, layman's terms, lipids, we're talking about fats. Uh, specifically, I would like to mention things like fats, phospholipids, and waxes. Um, fatty acids, again, the commonly termed monomer for the lipids, not really, um, not all lipids are made with fatty acids, but it's probably the sort of individual units you see most. Okay? Uh, these are long chain hydrocarbon molecules. So this would be an example of a long chain hydrocarbon right here. Uh, notice all of the carbons with hydrogens added into them. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> bound to a glycerol at the top. The glycerols will link the hydrocarbons to one another. Uh, two types of fatty acids that we see, saturated fatty acids. Um, if you think in terms of saturating something like a sponge, uh, when a sponge is saturated, it is completely full. If you look here, okay, this would be an example of a saturated fatty acid. Okay. Everybody that can see it, this would be an example of a saturated fatty acid. Uh, all of the carbon bonds, and carbon can make four bonds, all of the carbon bonds within this fatty acid are saturated. Every possible bond that can be made is being made. And what you end up with is this long, straight chain of carbons. Okay. Because of this, saturated fats are usually solids at room temp. Okay. Uh, when it comes to unsaturated fats, what we see are the presence of double bonds okay. uh, in at least one place, if not several, within that uh, long chain hydrocarbon. And those double bonds will actually cause kinks. Okay. In the chains of hydrocarbons, uh, giving this particular fatty acid more fluidity. It's a little bit more movable for this reason. The unsaturated fats are often liquids at room temperature. Okay. Uh, we see lots of cells storing triglycerides uh, long term as droplets or individual globules. Uh, 
when we move into talking about things like phospholipid bilayers, uh, interestingly enough, in a phospholipid, one thing we see is a large phosphate head uh, that's actually usually charged. This is what we often term the hydrophilic head. Okay. Uh, and then this nonpolar okay, or hydrophobic tail. Okay. Now, the interesting thing that you're going to see go on here is that <clears throat> these hydrophilic and hydrophobic regions of the cell membrane actually naturally aggregate together. They naturally come together in this particular way. Okay. What we see is the hydrophilic okay. regions to the outside. It's nice that I can change colors a little bit here. I see these hydrophilic regions okay. uh, to the outsides of a phospholipid bilayer. And this would be, we'll say this can be inside of the cell, this can be outside of the cell. Uh, you could just as easily switch it around. Either one would have been fine, okay, especially since this is a partial drawing. Uh, and then here, okay, these end up being hydrophobic regions, okay, or regions that are water-fearing. Basically, in here, uh, these regions would like to prevent water from passing through the cell. Now we know that water passes through uh, the cell membrane or through things like aquaporins, uh, but the reality is those hydrophobic regions actually help keep certain things um, outside the cell or inside of the cell because they prevent this sort of automatic penetration of the liquids and the things dissolved in the liquids uh, from moving through this phospholipid bilayer, right? So this right here says it's going to be difficult to move through the phospholipid bilayer. This is what gives us that cell membrane, that nice little bit of regulation between the inside of the cell and the outside of the cell. <clears throat> now the waxes, we've already spoken about waxes. Uh, mycolic acid we found in uh, mycobacterium, uh, in other words, the bacteria that were causing leprosy and tuberculosis. If you remember that mycolic acid made these guys particularly difficult to stain, right? And these were the acid fast bacteria, right? Uh, they were difficult to stain and that mycolic acid coating was antiphagocytic. Okay. It's what gave those TB bacteria the ability to live inside of a macrophage. So the organisms can be engulfed, but they will never actually be digested during phagocytosis. Okay. All right, I'm going to stop the video here. We'll come into proteins, our third macromolecule. Uh, we'll start this on video two. I'm going to try to make these a little bit shorter so you can watch them in snippets instead of long uninterrupted lectures.